extremist. He had even murdered my father, the first democratically elected president of the country. My father knew that you can imprison a person, but not an idea. You can exile a person, but not an idea. You can kill a person, but not an idea. But that hadn't filtered down to Zia. My father was sentenced to death, and despite an international outcry, he was hanged. At first, the triumph of these extremists was merely a tragedy for Pakistan. It would soon become an international one. For Zia and his regime were hoping to extend their influence beyond our borders. And their chance came when the Soviet Union invaded neighboring Afghanistan in 1979. Young men from all over the Muslim world took up arms against the Soviet enemy. And Pakistan became a safe haven for those who provided financial and military support to these Mujahideen. One man in particular was emerging as one of the leaders of the rebellion. His name, of course, was Osama bin Laden. And a new, virulent strain of Islamic extremism was conceived. In little more than two decades, it would spread from the mountains of Afghanistan across the globe. Ironically, money from the West now flooded my country to help it counter the Soviet threat. And soon these Mujahideen were weighed down with the best weapons dollars could buy. Many of these young men were given military and religious training in extremist madrasas, which had sprung up throughout Pakistan, mostly in the north. Schools, which had become a breeding ground for terrorists and where, contrary to Islam, students were brainwashed against equal rights, against tolerance, and against other religions. They were telling these young, poor people who were basically children of Afghan Mujahideen or children of the most desperate and uh, destitute families of Pakistan that we'll give you free clothing, we'll give you free shelter, we'll give you free home, we'll give you a free uh, education. And what were they teaching them? They were teaching them, you're a Muslim, it's your duty to kill the Hindus, it's your duty to kill the Jews, it's your duty to kill the Christians, and it's your duty to kill the Shias, it's your duty to kill anybody who diverts themselves from the road of Islam. But I was in jail and in solitary confinement and not in any position to speak out against Zia and his policies. Ever since my father's death, I had become a threat and for the next six years, I was under house arrest. I had no idea whether I would be set free or possibly face jail and execution. But I knew that the tyrants in the regime can only eliminate people. They cannot eliminate concepts. After my imprisonment and the period of solitary confinement, I was forced into exile. Even if the West supported him, I was determined to continue the fight against Zia. And when he lifted martial law, I was finally able to return to Pakistan in 1986. There are moments in life which are not possible to describe. My return to Lahore was one of them. Hundreds of color balloons soared into the sky as the airport gates opened. The sea of humanity lining the roads jammed on balconies and roofs wedged on trees and on lampposts was more like an ocean. The black, green and red colors of the PPP seemed the only colors in Lahore that day.
They shouted, Wazir uh, Azam Benazir, Prime Minister Benazir. And for the first time, it dawned on me that I was a possible contender for the Prime Ministership of Pakistan. We could have taken over power yesterday if my party had believed in violence, if we had believed in bloodshed. That crowd was so respons responsive that we could have taken Lahore yesterday, but my party did not want bloodshed. Elections were called for the summer of 1988. As the campaign picked up, there were many who said that I couldn't be elected prime minister because I was a woman. I was told that the military would never allow a woman to be elected prime minister of Pakistan. I was told that the religious parties would never allow a woman to be elected prime minister of Pakistan. And it wasn't just the religious parties in Pakistan. There was a fierce debate across the entire Muslim world. I didn't know how to react to this religious bigotry and prejudice. I could respond if somebody told me that my policies for health were wrong. I could argue. But how could I argue on, you know, that I, I was a woman and I knew I was a woman and I, I was happy and satisfied to see that my supporters did not see this as an issue. On December 2nd, 1988, I became the first woman to head the government of a Muslim majority state. I was just 35. The voice of America described me as a breath of fresh air and symbol of the new democratic Pakistan. I wanted to break the elitism. I wanted to break the cycle that kept the poor poor and made the rich richer. I wanted each Pakistani, irrespective of whether they were born from the working classes or the middle classes, to aspire to the greatest posts um, in the country. But it was a bad time to become prime minister. The militants were killing people in my country. They were gunning them down in the streets of Pakistan. They were gunning them down as they worshipped God in the mosques. We were on the brink of being declared a terrorist state. That's not what I wanted for Pakistan. And so my government and I began to tackle the terrorists. I worked very closely with my military and with my intelligence, said fan out, go to all these madrasas that are political and tell them they're not going to teach hate. If they want to live in Pakistan, they have to live by our laws and our laws say no interference in other countries. But the reactionaries fought back. Most Pakistanis who woke up to the news that their prime minister had been sacked overnight showed little surprise. I had the support of the people of Pakistan, but I was undemocratically thrown out of office because I was a modern progressive woman, a woman who had been exposed to the ideas of democracy, diversity and pluralism in the Western societies. They saw me as a threat and they eliminated my leadership. The Islamic extremists had conspired against me. But they were infecting the rest of the world too. By the mid-1990s, they'd achieved a notable success in neighboring Afghanistan. They'd driven the Soviets out and set up their own regime there, the Taliban, which actively supported terrorism. And in one of the country's secret camps, Osama bin Laden was planning his next move. In less than a decade, the world itself would witness the inhumanity and depravity of these reactionaries. On the 11th September 2001, two planes flew into New York's World Trade Center killing almost 3,000 innocent people. It was the first time since Pearl Harbor that there had been an attack of such magnitude on the United States. I was in Dubai when I first heard about the attack on the Twin Towers and I quickly put on the television and I was just in time to catch the second plane going into the Twin Towers. And it was really a moment when you thought 
that perhaps we are on the edge of world war and what's happening all government is breaking down all order is breaking down the world as we know it um, is breaking down no one is immune from attacks like these 